Welcome to Stocks in Translation. I'm Jared Blickery, and I am joined by the voice of the people, Sydney Freed, as always. Thank you for tuning in. And before we begin, take a minute to subscribe, comment on Stocks in Translation on Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, wherever you get your podcast sources. And today we are we are welcoming Jack Manley. He is the global market strategist at J.P. Morgan Asset Managers. Jack, thank you. We got a lot to talk about today. Yeah. So here's what's on the docket. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Fed and earnings. Our phrase of the day is dual mandate. <laughs> and the, uh, the viewers might be surprised that there's actually a third mandate. So we'll get into that. And this episode is brought to you by the number 96. That is how many weeks it has been since tech had a better one. And let's go beyond the noise here, Jack. We got, uh, we got Dow at a record high. We got the S&P 500 almost there. The equal weight is there. Investors got a big uh, Fed decision this week. And uh, full disclosure, that's going to be in the rear view mirror by the time this airs. But ah. how are you thinking about the markets right now? <laughs> well, I, I think that interest rate policy is always going to be at the center of any conversation around around investing, right? I mean, I think it, it maybe goes without saying, but it's worth saying anyway. Like, how a fixed income fits into your portfolio has to do with rates, right? It's coupon, it's duration. How stocks fit into your portfolio has to do with rates. It's valuations, it's earnings growth. So that to me is always foundational. And any time you have uh, either a Fed meeting or an opportunity to hear from a Fed governor, including Jay Powell, that's where all the attention needs to be. This meeting is particularly yes. interesting, right? For a couple of reasons. I mean, the first one, a little bit more obvious, uh, it will be the first rate cut, right? Hotly anticipated. I mean, we've been kind of thinking about it. It's kind of funny. We've been, been talking. a few years. It's been a few years. <laughs> we've been talking about this rate cut since the hike started. Yeah. Like, yeah. think about that. Like, one of, one of the more interesting things about this whole process is that when the Fed put out its sort of trajectory for interest rate policy, it told us that wherever it took rates to was not where it was going to hold them. We always knew rate cuts were coming, and it's finally here, right? So the it's a cycle. <laughs> I, th I, I thought it was not. coming in March. That <laughs> when we were producing all of our segments, everyone was like, it's happening in March. And then oh, I, yeah. it's happening May, June. I mean, I was having conversations last year with clients where people were convinced the Fed would be cutting last November, last December. I mean, and at the start of this year, the market was looking for 125, 150 basis points of easing. Like, you're not alone in being confused around when this thing so is, is happening. But I can say, I mean, Nothing's guaranteed, right? But I can say pretty comfortably that by mm -hmm. the time this gets published, we, have, we will have witnessed the first rate cut of this cycle. Let's get into some of the uh, Fed speak here, because yeah. I want to break down our phrase of the day. Yeah. It's dual mandate. And um, let me just break it down. The, the dual mandate of the U.S. Federal Reserve System, as prescribed by Congress, so this is by law, sets forth the guiding principles of monetary policy, maximum employment, and stable prices. But if you crack open your handy copy of the Federal Reserve Act, Section 2A, <laughs> Sydney, you're going to find there I are actually been. three mandates. It's maximum employment, stable prices, and moderate long-term interest rates. So what's going on? From what I've been able to determine about 20 years ago, sometime in the aughts, the Federal Reserve uh, decided that moderate long-term interest rates and stable prices meant kind of the same thing. Mm. So they wrapped those up into one. So just broadly speaking, we got jobs and prices, which is inflation. How do you think about the dual mandate, Jack? So I would say for a very long time, only one side of that dual mandate got any sort of love, inflation, right? And that was inflation. Yeah. I mean, and for very good reason. You had a labor market that was extremely healthy, right? Remember, the unemployment rate was, it hit like a 60-year low, I think, uh, just a little over a year ago, and up until very recently had been at or below 4% for over two and a half years. Like, the Fed's not worried about labor. Everything's going well with labor. Inflation, though, for a while was a mess. Like, not too long ago, 2022, sure. June CPI came in at 9.1%. That is not just the high watermark for this cycle. It is the high watermark for the last... 40 plus years like inflation had never been this bad so the fed paid like pathological attention to it it was the only <laughs> thing that matters who knows anything who cares anything about the labor market since then though inflation has gotten a whole lot better right we went from 9.1 percent to 3.0 percent over a 12-month period from june of 22 to june of 23. yeah rather incredible and then i mean you know what's funny about that by the way that means that inflation actually was transitory like that oh. word <laughs> that word has become the butt of so many jokes when like you're talking about fed policy but there has literally never been an instance in history 
where you've been able to make so much progress on inflation in such a short period of can time. You, can you define transitory for our viewers <laughs> on who might not know? On a long timeline, everything yeah. is transitory. Yes, <laughs> that okay. is, that's a very, yeah, in okay. the long run, we're all dead, right? I think that's like, that's <laughs> oh, like, God, the, 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 I think that's the Milton Freemanism. I, I'm pretty sure that's him. Um, so in this case, I would say a 12 month period mm. where you're able to move from 9.1%, which is very clearly bad inflation, mm. to 3.0%, which is pretty darn close to normal inflation. That feels somewhat transitory to me. So call it a year from peak to almost trough. That's that's not bad. OK. Yeah. So the Fed was so focused on inflation mm -hmm. for so long. Is that the right way to go about it when you see inflation running so hot? You say, well, I'm going to deal with this side of the dual mandate and I'm going to completely ignore the other side of the dual mandate. Is that doesn't it happen works? that often? No, <laughs> it, it doesn't. And, and you know what? Like I I have to give them some credit here. I think I think they played this the right way. But there is something kind of funny to be said about what's gone on with inflation as it relates to interest rate policy. Because if you look at inflation in 2022, when it was off the charts, out of control, right, 9.1%, I always like to sort of interesting thought exercise here. Like, what's the world look like in 2022? What's going on? Sure. Uh, you had Let's Russia just invaded Ukraine, right? Two large producers and exporters of commodity products, food and fuel. Yeah, and you oil know, went to 130. Oil's out of control. We don't know what pipelines are getting blown up, farms are getting burned down. Like We don't know how war is going to impact our ability to access critical, vital commodities. And so prices move higher. At the same time, you have China doubling down on zero COVID. Right. The rest of the world has learned to live with this thing. We've moved on. We're back in school. We're back at work. We're out on vacation. We're dining out. We're seeing shows and concerts. China's economy is still locked down. Mm -hmm. Their manufacturing output is still hamstrung and finished goods are still harder to come by. 2022 inflation was scarcity. We were able to crush inflation from 9.1 percent to 3.0 percent in 12 short months transitory, right, by removing some of those things from the equation, right? We rerouted commodity supply chains. Uh, Russia used to be Europe's largest provider of natural gas. Mm -hmm. Now we are, right? China finally abandoned zero COVID, reopened their economy. Very slowly. Uh, very slowly, but they did yeah. it. And, you know, energy went from being inflationary to deflationary, uh, uh, goods from inflationary to deflationary. And bring all this up, right, because... We moved from 9.1% to 3.0% and had nothing to do with interest rates. Like the Fed could have done nothing and inflation would have moved in the, from 9.1 to 3.0 because the Fed has no control over supply side issues. And that's what was going on with inflation. In but what about the lag? So that there, I would think, though, that even if that wasn't the Fed was not the proximate cause of that reduction in inflation, that there mm -hmm. would be some lags. The long and variable lags that we're always talking about couldn't it be the, f the fact that we're feeling this now, perhaps, on a delayed basis. Maybe, but I think even there you're, you're, you're running into some problems because what's been going on with inflation, let's say, over the last 12 months, it has been almost singularly driven by shelter costs. Like that has been the the largest component of inflation. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I feel like a lot of people may not necessarily realize if they hear <laughs> shelter, right, when they're looking at, at inflation, they would think that home prices are probably baked into yes. there somewhere. They're actually not. Mm -hmm. Really odd, but the Fed looks much more closely, excuse me, the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics who put out, puts out the CPI numbers, the inflation numbers, looks either directly at rent or indirectly at rent through something called owner's equivalent rent gets a lot of a lot of airtime, a lot of people paying attention to this, but essentially a made up number, right? It's mm -hmm. a survey that that's conducted of, of of homeowners. And while the Fed was raising interest rates from March of 22 to uh, July of 23, mortgage rates in some cases nearly tripled, right? We went from like two and a half percent on a 30 year to almost eight percent on a 30 year. And if you're looking to buy a home, after the Fed starts raising rates, you're in trouble, right? So if you can't afford to buy a home, you decide to rent instead. And it's therefore no coincidence that over that same time period, rents in this country increase by over 10%. Mm -hmm. And if rent is what's incorporated into shelter costs, not so much home prices, mm -hmm. rent went up by 10% while the Fed was raising interest rates. And rent reflects a lagged reality because you don't sign a one month lease, you sign a 12 month lease or a 24 month lease. There is your delayed lag. Yeah, I'm pretty, pretty sure impact, my rent up right? went up by 20%, but yes, yes, to your <laughs> yeah. point. Well, for those, those of us in New York City, yeah, maybe a little bit tougher. But yeah, that, that's, mm -hmm. th there are still, there are implications right now of yes. monetary policy on inflation yeah. today, but they're not necessarily positive ones. Bringing it back to that headline inflation number, yeah. we talk yeah. a lot about the Fed's target 2% rate. Mm -hmm. How was 2% 
is that that's how, that's stable prices if we're at two percent inflation? That's what it means. It, it's somewhat how arbitrary, yeah. maybe, but you know, yeah, that's what we have. Yeah, I, 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 I think it is arbitrary. arbitrary. It, it is. I mean, it, it feels like I guess in an economy that is growing at around two percent. Uh, a 2% inflation target feels somewhat reasonable. And if you look at trend U.S. GDP growth over the last 20 plus years, like since the start of the millennium, mm -hmm. it's been around 2%. So yeah, let's call it 2% 2, 2 inflation. Yeah. But um, you know, it, it's funny because a lot of people think of inflation as the enemy, right? Uh, deflation is also bad. You don't want, you don't want prices well, in our banking lower. system, it's really bad. It's really bad. Given so, the system we so have. You have to, you have to target like some kind of sweet spot, and 2% is evidently... Wait, bad. I love that because you don't actually want 0% inflation, right? I feel like I recently... It's very, it's very diffi it's difficult for banks to function in 0% inflation because they can get caught on the wrong... Their balance sheets can get all out of whack. Leverage seems to be built into the system. Like, mm -hmm. our system needs a certain amount of leverage to function properly, and I think that's what the 2% provides. But it makes people's heads kind of go wide open yeah. because 2% is not zero. Yeah. You know, wouldn't zero be the stable it's price? It's counterintuitive, it is. Yeah. And so over time, you know, you know, over 100 years, you're losing a lot of purchasing power. So that's, I think that's where the kind of confusion or some of the thinking goes. Mm -hmm. I have another question. So when yeah, yeah. we get a lot of economic data, we really try and put it into context of what the Fed will do with it mm -hmm. or think about it, how it will affect it. Is that always the way it is or just during these, this crazy tightening cycle where we're waiting matter, for yeah. rates? Yeah. Yeah. I would say it's the only way you can approach it if you're trying, if you buy that narrative that rates mm -hmm. are the only thing that matters, which at least right now seems to be the case, mm -hmm. then you have to think about these numbers in aggregate at a national level. Like one of the one of the tougher conversations that I have when I'm traveling and talking to clients is I'll, I'll, I'll give like blanket statements like food CPI has essentially zeroed out over the last 12 months. And then someone will inevitably raise their hand and be Eggs like, well, my grocery <laughs> yeah. bill. And yeah. you know, I, I, in some cases, I almost feel like I'm a therapist. It's like, you know, I sit there, I'm like, yes, you're well, that's right. That's what we I'm are. Sorry. That's why we're here. We're therapists for America. <laughs> yeah. We're counseling everybody on their money here. <laughs> but, but I always have to remind people that like, you know, if we're taking this back down to a markets conversation, I, I, I feel sorry for you know your, you and your grocery bill, but the Fed does not care how much you're paying for eggs, right? Like that's not what the story is. So at least as it relates to investing to markets, mm -hmm. I do think it is those aggregate numbers and how they feed through into Fed policy. Headline: yeah. Fed doesn't care about your egg prices. <laughs> yeah, they don't. I'm sorry. <laughs> it is a headline. All right, we got to take a quick break here. Coming up, the tech sector it just got a it just hit a giant milestone, and we've also got Gen Z, millennials, and boomers. They are facing it off in a who wore it better for the generations. We are back and this episode brought to you by the number 96. That is the number of weeks it's been since tech had a better week. So last week tech was up 8% and you'd have to go back to November of 2022 to find the next best week. And much like last year, we saw this blistering start to the year. Then around mid-year, mm -hmm. prices kind of fell off a bit, but we didn't hit a bear market yes last year. We had rotation and mm -hmm. that's kind of what we're seeing now. The Dow happens to be at a record, the Nasdaq isn't. So how do you see this seesaw that we're playing out? When does everything hit record highs every day again? <laughs> I think that's what I'm people waiting, want to know. I'm that's waiting what everybody for that. Wants to know. Yeah. I, I wish I had the answer to that. Um, I mean, I, I think when we look at today's equity market and really the equity market of the last, let's call it 18, 19, 20 months, it very clearly has been a story driven by just a small handful of names, right? That's where that Magnificent Seven moniker comes from. These are U.S. domiciled, mega cap, multinational technology companies that one way or another are gassed up on this idea that artificial intelligence is going to fundamentally transform the world as we know it. And if you think about what drives markets over the long run, it's earnings. Earnings drive prices. And if you look at earnings growth within the S&P 500 at least, the MAG 7's been the only game in town. Like they, 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 they grew their earnings by something like 30, 31% in 2023. The rest of the market saw their earnings contract. The first quarter of this year, MAG 7 earnings growth, 50%. The rest of the market saw earnings contract, right? So it's no surprise that the MAG 7 was the only game in town. They're the only companies that are making money in what is uh, clearly a, a challenging environment. But now we are in, in sort of a, a different chapter of this book, I, I, I guess I'd say, where the psychology has changed a little bit. You know, one of the things that is happening is a lot of investors are looking at the MAG-7, in particular what we refer to as the hyperscalers, the people mm -hmm. that are investing a lot in, in AI, and asking, where's the money? Right, like you've been pouring 
hundreds of billions of dollars so into this. Where stock. are all those co-pilot subscriptions? Where, where yeah. is the money, right? And like the, the, the thing that's tough about AI, and I'm by no stretch of the imagination like an AI expert, but the thing that to me is, is tough about AI is that no one can argue that this stuff isn't cool. It is undoubtedly <laughs> cool, right? I've, I've seen cool the arguments. Yes. It <laughs> is cool, but is it worth a trillion dollars? Like, is it a trillion dollars cool? And maybe it will be, but at least right now it isn't. So all of a sudden people are a little bit more, I don't know, they're, they're a little bit more thoughtful about that story, and they're looking at valuations that are super stretched. They're looking at earnings price, or earnings expectations that are just priced for perfection. They're being a little bit more critical. They're asking where's the money, right? Mm -hmm. On the other side of this, though, something else that's very interesting is happening, which is that if you think about this macro backdrop that we, we were sort of laying out earlier, right, we are talking about inflation cooling, okay. We didn't talk about this, but, but I'll mention it anyway. Uh, wage growth is moderating, and you sure. see evidence of that in the labor reports, right? August numbers, July numbers, wage growth is moderating. We okay. can hit the labor, yeah. And interest rates are going to move lower. Like, in fact, by the time this is published, they will have moved lower, right? And in this environment, where wage growth is moderating, inflation is cooling, and rates are moving lower, that's a trifecta for profitability. Mm -hmm. It means you don't have to be the MAG-7 anymore to make money in, in this new environment. And in fact, if you look at earnings growth, it was positive for the S&P 493, if you want to call them that, in the second quarter. We expect it to stay positive in the third quarter and to bounce back in a big way in the fourth quarter. So you have these two things happening simultaneously where one of them is investors are getting a little bit I don't want to say sick of, but at least a, a, little, a little bit cautious about their allocation to the MAG-7. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, they finally have somewhere where they can actually deploy capital that's not the MAG-7. And so I don't know if I'm necessarily looking for more all-time highs from where we are, although you can't ever root against the U.S. equity market. That's a bad call. Mm -hmm. But that rotation, right, that you, you had mentioned earlier, Jared, like that to me is the story that we're really sinking our teeth into, teeth yes. into. This idea that the other players on the team are showing up to the game and they're finally ready to compete. That's what's exciting about equities right now. If you're an average investor and you just get a little more cash and you're looking to put it into the market, are you, should I not put it towards the MAG-7 right now? Should it yeah, go somewhere else? Where would you put it? Where where you would see you the put best it? Because, you know, tech, you know, there's likely to still see a seal recovery, yep. but you're saying there's other opportunities right now. So maybe I'm not talking about a person that's trading every day. I'm talking about someone who just ha got a little more cash. Oh, I'm going to put it in the market. Keep yeah. it there for asking a while. Asking for a friend. Yeah. Asking, for, <laughs> asking for a friend. Asking for me. Yeah. Bye. I mean, you know, r r right off the bat, first thing to point out, I'm a long-term tech mm. bull. Just, like with everything I just said, I'm a long-term yeah. tech bull. No one will tell you it's going to be less important in 10 years than okay. it is right now. Nobody does it better than the U.S. Mm. The second thing that's worth pointing out here is that while we do expect earnings growth to broaden out, mm -hmm. the MAG-7 is still going to be making money this year. So it's not like this is an inverse of what happened last year. It's not like the MAG-7 become the losers. It just mm -hmm. means that there are more winners this year than, than there were last year. But if I'm thinking about how to deploy new capital right now, I think a diversified basket of large cap U.S. equities is going to be your safest play. So whether that is an S&P 500 allocation or approaching that through active management, buying a specific mutual fund, right? I don't think you you want to have to make sector bets. I don't think you want to have to make style box bets. Hmm. I think what you want to do is acknowledge that for the first time in a while, you're fishing in a pretty big pond, so you can cast. So this is not net. a stock picker's environment, is what you're saying. Um, basically, you're, you're saying kind of like cast a wide net with large, with large caps. Well, I'm saying I'm saying cast a wide net in the sense that you don't want to boil this down to growth versus value or okay. you know, yeah, tech versus not, energy. Not the styles, not uh, the sectors. It, it, I, get like, that. The, it, I think it actually is a, a, a stock picker's market right now okay. because if you think about this 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 improving backdrop, the macro backdrop that I discussed earlier that helps to support a broadening out of earnings growth, it doesn't mean that all 493 names in the S&P 500 that didn't do anything are going to start to do something. It just means that some of them will. Well, let's think about which ones might do that. You mentioned profitability as a big factor. You yeah. see pro the, the environment for profitability um, is good in at least two or three different ways. How do you how do you think those companies that are geared towards cash flow will do those with the, the, bid, the good balance sheets? And good balance sheet mattered a little bit ago, but not so much right now. Yeah. Well, I, I still think strong balance sheets are very important right now. Uh, and coming back to that interest rate conversation <laughs> we were having earlier, right? Yeah. Which is that like money is getting cheaper, but it's not going to be free anytime soon, right? And we're no gonna, more ZERP. Like, no more ZERP, no more ZERP, certainly no more 
NERP globally, at yes. least, right? I think that that era is, is behind us. There's no more bonds at zero interest rates globally. Thank <laughs> exactly. You. So as long as you can, as long as money still costs something, you have to be a little bit more thoughtful about how you allocate, which means quality, which means in some cases a, um, a, 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 a strong balance sheet. But you know, when I look at sort of the opportunities out there, at least from a sector perspective, if we're thinking high level, because I don't, I don't do you know, individual names. I th I'm a more sure. portfolio mm -hmm. strategist, right? When I think about sectors, in addition to those big, big meaty macro tailwinds, right, that we talked about earlier, there are three sectors that I think are particularly interesting that investors should pay attention to outside of tech. Yeah. One of them is financials, one of them is materials, one of them is uh, healthcare. Those are the three that I think are particularly interesting. And materials to me might be the, the, the most interesting one of these three, because if we think about what happened in 2023, the materials sector was down the oh, let's just break. This is like r literally raw materials. Raw, it could be yeah. iron. It could be gold. The exactly. Copper, things Lumber, like building concrete. stuff. I love yeah. materials. Exactly. <laughs> I'm a material guy. Material I girl yeah. over You're here. Material <laughs> girl. Well, we live <laughs> in a material world, so I, I, I understand that. You know, we went through a, a horrible year for materials names last year because at the start of 2023, everybody was convinced the U.S. was going to enter a recession at any moment, right? Like that was the narrative. 2023, the U.S. is going to enter a recession. And by the, the dollar goes up. <laughs> and if we're in a recession, nobody's building anything, right? Yeah. So you actually go through this this something something of an earnings recession in materials because nobody's building anything. And even if you are trying to build something, you got no labor. You got no people to come in and build this stuff, at least not for exorbitant costs. Well, you look at where we are in 2024 right now, and there is no recession. The labor backlog has been eased, at least partially through immigration. And Washington passed a whole lot of fiscal stimulus last year through the Chips and Science Act amongst other things, that is pouring billions, if not trillions of dollars into building stuff. And so you have all these things coming together outside of the high level narrative of, yeah, inflation's easing and rates are moving lower, that is supportive of a real nice bounce back in the material sector. You know, healthcare, I think, is also very interesting. Bad recession for healthcare last year because it, COVID is yeah. done, right? And we're not getting those COVID revenues anymore, but now it's GLP ones, yeah. So on today's Who Wore It Better, we are delving into market psychology, crisscrossing the generations. We want to know of the following, millennials, Gen Z, Gen X, the boomers, uh, maybe the lost generation, who is best prepared for the current market environment, beginning with the observation that each generation has experienced the market uniquely. So tell us how these diff di different generations might be thinking about this market and who's best prepared for it. So I, I have kind of a funny answer to this, I think, which is that Gen Z is probably the closest to being able to get it right. Interesting. But they're doing it really wrong right now. Like they have, I think, like a good psychology for it. It's just been been, been implemented a bit too extremely. Okay. Right? I need so, more. Yeah, I, so I need me, more. And it's not just because I'm a millennial. Yeah. It's not, I'm just, I was gonna I'm say, not just like raining on the Gen Z for it. <laughs> so if if you look at if you look at how different generations experience different market cycles, one of the things that I think is super interesting is that when you compare um, to to millennials, to Gen X, to baby boomers before them. Gen Z has had by far the best experience with the stock market, by far, on an annualized return basis. Because if you think of when these people really started to invest, a lot of them were post-COVID meltdown, and then it's just been all sunshine and rainbows since then, right? I mean, yeah, we've had some volatility here and there. 2022 I mean, wasn't a great year. crypto almost died, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, and that kind of, that's sort of a follow-up to this, right? They have like, such a long runway <clears throat> in front of that. So, if we only got a minute, but I want to make sure we get this in. I completely agree. So, so they're, they're jazzed on equities, and that's a good thing, right? They've also had the worst bond performance of any generation, right? Bonds have done nothing but hurt them over the last few years of investing, so they want nothing to do with fixed income. And that's probably a, a decent thing because you've got a long runway. You don't really you don't need, need that right income. Now. You don't need the income. But when that is reflected in super concentrated positions, including in cryptocurrencies, that's where this all goes wrong. So if you can stay optimistic about stocks, be a little bit cautious about holding too much in bonds and in cash, especially as a young investor, that's the way to do it. Just don't go too extreme on that, I'd say. Jack, love it. And uh, guess what? We're winding things down here. 24 minutes goes real fast. We want to we wanna make sure you check out all the up other episodes of Stocks in Translation on the Yahoo Finance site and mobile app, also on all your favorite podcast platforms like YouTube, Apple, and Spotify. That is all for now. Keep your dial tuned to Yahoo Finance.